Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Get to Know Your Scholar here on Bucky TV. I'm your host for this episode, Sean Abbas. I'm here with Brother Hussein al Nashid, who has been lecturing across the globe since 2005, everywhere from here in, in America to Australia, the UK, Europe, and Africa. Uh, he, he grew up in the UK and is originally from Iraq. Welcome, Brother al Nashid. Can you tell us what are you up to nowadays? So, I'm currently in Dearborn. Um, I'm working on a number of projects, uh, aside from doing my own work, which is in uh, IT. i um, currently working on performing arts, setting up a new podcast, and generally just creating a platform for our Shia youth to express themselves as Muslims living and working in the Western part of the world. Um, and expressing themselves through the platforms that we know and recognize in the West, such as podcasts, uh, performing arts in the theater. Um, we're also in the progress, uh, currently in the very early stages, um, of having a, uh, like a TV show where we release like a 10 minute short every week and the series follows the life of one of the companions of the Prophet, um, or stories from the Quran Karim that can, be much more easy uh, to relate to and bite size so that uh, you don't have to sit in a one hour much this, mm -hmm. but you know, your children can watch a short 10 minute video and still take a moral lesson about their religion and their identity and heritage. So, so is your goal really to uh, inspire the youth and be able to connect with a younger generation? It's, <clears throat> I think, the correct way for me to express it, at the very least, um, if I were to put a mission statement, it's to build a bridge that connects us as Muslims living in the Western world with our religious identity that is stemming from a Middle Eastern world. Um, because there isn't much representation for us. Um, we don't see ourselves in the media, except in the negative. We don't see, for example, uh, you know, the main character in a movie is a woman in hijab or uh, the Muslim guy saves the day. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's very important to be able to see yourself, especially when we are so heavily uh, influenced by the media that we consume. So it's not only about connecting the Muslims with their identity so that we can have a source of pride in the rich culture that we come from, um, because one of the things about America is it's a place where many cultures have influenced what we today call American culture, because essentially there really was, wasn't uh, a culture in America. Um, but at the same time, we as Muslims kind of have been forgotten in the narrative of um, the whole uh, cultural flavors of America. Um, you you need to kind of like really dig deep and hard to find something positive about Muslims, um, even though we are a large portion of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, economy of this nation. Um, we are part of the actual infrastructure in that a lot of us work in the medical field. Um, a lot of us are professors and teachers and engineers. But in every field we've excelled, except for media, we haven't really excelled in that. And it's very important because media is representation and without representation, there's only going to be misrepresentation, which since 9-11, um, we as a Muslim community globally, but more in America than anywhere else have felt um, rejection, have felt resentment, have felt displaced. Um, a lot of anxiety has come from that and a lot of reform in our identity, right? And for example, hijab, um, and what is it? Is it now a fashion item or is it a philosophy on, and the way of life, right? So <clears throat> I think it's noble that we've had a response um, from, from the media um, or from those Muslims who want to get involved in the media. Um, I just feel that there needs to be more direction. Um, and we hope, inshallah, these projects will kind of like fill that need. Um, by giving uh, the religious direction. Uh, obviously not that I'm uh, the right person for that. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a creative, um, but 
my circle uh, and speaking in the Majalis of the al Baytaim Salam Allah have put me in touch with my roots, have put me in touch with scholars um, far more learned than myself. And inshallah, this project is going to be a bridge between our self as Muslims in the West with our culture, but also on a grander scale, it will be um, baby steps to introducing the West to our religion, our values. And I don't mean by one hour lectures. I mean, um, again, we come back to this idea of like a short 10 minute video, but within that video, you can show so much of how a Muslim family actually interacts within a household, um, how we greet one another when we come into the home. How do we sit down? How do we eat? What do we normally do? What happens in a Muslim household, right? Um, these, they might seem small and tedious and minuscule, but for the one who, doesn't know what happens in a Muslim household. It could be a real eye-opener that, hey, they're just like us, you know, um, there isn't much of a difference. So inshallah, it will help to kind of um, get the ball rolling on positive uh, representation of the Muslim world. And how, how would you say how important is that positive representation for building the identity of the American Muslim, the American Muslim youth, <laughs> the ones that are growing up right now? I think it's very important um, on so many different levels, but primarily, and you know, again, since we're doing everything because of Islam and for Islam, um, we want to take, you know, examples from the early uh, days of Islam and, and, and were there circumstances where Muslims were being misrepresented, not that there is, you know, public opinion is a thing that is new in the human history, right? Um, very rarely could the public influence politics, right? So when you look at history, for example, empires, kings, emperors, aristocrats, it's always been a up-down kind of society where you're dictated to. Um, in, in the general sense of the world that we live in, especially here in the West, public relation really does carry a lot of weight. Um, and therefore, there's been, uh, there is now more so than ever a great need for public relations, you know, and, and to be engaged. You know, we see companies that go bust because, you know, their CEO got caught in hot waters. We see politicians who have to resign, right? Because the general public feels that they do not represent the ideals and the values and so on and so forth. All right. So shifting gears a little uh -huh. Oh, I, was just say, you know, I, I, was, I was trying to just tie it back to an incident where something happened, but it wasn't public relation, but kind of along those lines. Um, when the Muslims first left uh, the mini hijrah, what I would like to call, so there was the hijrah from Mecca to Medina, but before that, there was a group of Muslims who went, uh, led by Jafar Tayyar, alayhi salam Allah, who went from Mecca to Abyssinia. And there was a Christian king over there. And Abu Sufyan, what he did is instantaneously, he went to the people of Abyssinia and told the Muslims are like basically terrorists, which is what's happening in America today, right? Um, so someone came and spoke foul about us. The Quran immediately responded with a chapter of Mary, where it talks about similarities and it introduced the narrative of Mary from an Islamic point of view. So it told the Muslim narrative, right? Um, and there was this like first real glimpse of public relations in regards to how the government tells the rest of the society to deal with this new entity that is Islam. Um, so through dialogue, through engaging, and through uh, representing self, the Muslims were actually welcomed with open arms by the Christian community in that day. Today, unfortunately, with all the media and all the information that is out there, Muslims in what is really the largest Christian country on earth or the most powerful country Christian uh, a Christian country on earth the Muslims are seen as completely uh, you know we've been marginalized uh, we do we're not compatible for some reason which is nothing further than the truth right so I think it's very important for us to have that narrative and engage in the conversation inshallah to to change public uh, opinion of us so piggybacking kind of off of this so mm -hmm. Are you drawing your inspiration from historical figures or historical stories? 100%. Yeah. And yeah. how much uh, has your own personal life inspired you to do or even move towards this direction? Oh, my personal life, um, and I guess, you know, since this is about getting to know your scholar, um, 
in what I like to refer to as my days of Jahiliya. Um, <laughs> so, like most Muslims uh, who came to the West as a young generation, I, I got to the UK at the age of six. Um, there was this whole new world that we just found ourselves in. You know, I, I, I remember when the plane took off um, for London, it was such a shock to see all these women taking off their hijabs because they left a Muslim country. And now they're going to a part of the world where they no longer need that hijab. And that's not the discussion that we're having. But for me, there was this shock. There was this real question of identity, like who am I and, and what's going on over here? And having lived in a Muslim world where everyone on the streets is in a hijab, you kind of felt like it was very sacrilegious what was taking place. So I think that flight for me was the beginning of um, a real like need for me to kind of continuously have to travel back in time because when we moved to the West, there was no representation of self, right? So the only real representation of myself, the only time I could see what it meant to be a Muslim or a Shia Muslim was in between the pages of the books of history. So a lot of the times I would go to sleep and there'd be a book by my side. You know, I was, I think like I took after my father in, in the sense of being a bookworm. But my final thoughts before I go to sleep was like living in a world and, and escaping, if you will, to this world of elsewhere where Islam was a norm, where Islam wasn't different, where my mother in the UK in the first six weeks of being there, her hijab was pulled, you know, um, so it was a kind of a place where even though with all the diversity of the UK now, we're talking in 1991, 1992, we had what was called the NFL, which is the, uh, uh, sorry, it was not the NFL. And that's how you know I've been in America for too long. Um, we had the NF, which was called the National Front, which were all ex-military personnel who joined a racial political movement that basically harassed you if you were brown, right? Um, so as Muslims, we found a lot of that. Kind of veered off Islam for a while, um, like again, most of us, because in schools you get bullied, um, which our parents never really understood what bullying was because, you know, new generation, they're just, they're busy at work. They're trying to, you know, establish a foundation for this newfound home. And um, it was in the schools that you kind of got involved in the gang life. It was in the schools that you got introduced to drugs. It was in the schools that you got introduced to the clubbing scene and the partying and all the other things that happened while your parents really think, you know, oh, he's studying, she's studying, but you were getting involved in a lot of things. <clears throat> this idea of being fresh off the boat, you know, we have an accent when we first arrive. There's a lot of barriers and layers that kind of came in the way of who we were to the others. Mm -hmm. They never saw Hussein. They saw uh, an immigrant. They saw a person who was undesirable. They saw a person who was brown. They saw a person who was Muslim. They saw a person who had an accent. They saw a person who just didn't fit and majority of the time was the entertainment for others, that you pick on this person, you make mockery of this person. And for us, I believe, uh, and, and I'm sure you know, you may feel the same way, at least our generation, we kind of tried to be more white than the white people mm. so that we were accepted. We tried to be more American than American. We tried to be more British than British people. We kind of had this inferiority complex. And again, a lot of that stemmed from, we couldn't see any positive examples out in the community, right? On TVs, the hero's white, you know, the villain is black. Uh, the, in the UK, for the most part, even when brown people as a collective community, Hindu, Sikhs, Muslims, um, especially the Desi community, I remember there was a show called Goodness Gracious Me, right? Where we had to make fun of ourselves to be accepted in mainstream media, which is very true with what happened with African-Americans within um, American history. You know, they had to be the stand-up comedians. They had to be the funny guy, you know, the Chris Tucker, the Dave Chappelle, the everybody else. But they used that platform for a noble cause, which brought light to these issues. And growing up, there was a lot, again, as I said, because there was no current representation, we had to live in the books. We had to live in the history. 
So a lot of the inspiration that now comes and stems um, from these ideas is, and I say this to myself at the very least, I don't say it to people, but I always tell myself whenever I'm talking to another Muslim, I'm never disappointed with another Muslim for their lack of faith in Islam. Nor am I ever disappointed in a non-Muslim in their lack of understanding in Islam because I think these things are norms based on the current circumstances which we live. And I say that in the sense that I'm of the belief that there is no real Islam today. By the books or by what it was and what you read growing up about the life of the Prophet, the life of the Imams, the life of the companions, we're in a very, very different, we're seeing a very washed down, very watered down Islam, right? Um, so to kind of tie this in with what we're talking about, about going back to history, I believe that we kind of need to bring a marriage between our past and our present in order to have a child known as the future, right? Um, growing up in the UK, I, I was very, very, very heavily influenced by performing arts and theatre. It was, it was the one place that, you know, uh, a migrant child can dream to be whatever he wants to be and everyone would actually believe it because it was on the merit of their performance and not every other label that kind of society puts on you. And um, <clears throat> there was one powerful performance uh, by uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and it was William Shakespeare in a contemporary world. Um, and then they went on to do Macbeth and so on and so forth. I don't know if you yeah, recall it. I'm familiar with that. Right. So that kind of really was the catalyst. It's, this is a project I've been dreaming about since the age of 15, 16. But now, you know, the pieces are finally coming together. The, the support structure, alhamdulillah, being exposed to such a wide Muslim community and such a wide talent through speaking um, has kind of brought me into touch with a lot of people who are like-minded. So that, for me, that that performance by Leonardo DiCaprio and taking Shakespeare from the stage of, you know, thou must and this and that and all that old English and setting it in a setting which is contemporary where there are cars, there's, you know, projects, there's buildings, there's people dressed in jackets and a suit and, 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 and I could, it was so much more relatable and I enjoyed that rendition um, or representation of Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet because it was more relatable, right? And I kind of took that philosophy with me wherever I went. I mean, I'm wearing a hoodie right now um, because my target audience is the American Muslim, is the British Muslim, is the person who is more comfortable in a hoodie than they are comfortable in, uh, you know, a turban and a cloak. And it's the idea of being always uh, relatable and being present, right? So the scripts and without kind of God giving too much of the script away because obviously we want the excitement to remain there. It's taking the story of Karbala and setting it in downtown Chicago, for example, right? A scene within, say, the south side of Chicago. And it always poses the question, what would Imam Hussein have done if he was in the circumstances? How would he have addressed certain issues? Um, we take examples from like Maytham Tamar and we put him in a BLM movement, right? If Maytham Tamar was part of the Black Lives Matter movement, what would he have done? How would we have seen Maytham as a personality in history and as a character and of principles? How would that shine and lend support to the BLM movement? Because in doing these things, it actually can plant ideas and it will highlight the relatable uh, values within Islam and other resistant movements which are taking place in the world right now um, and, and how Islam can actually be a very good partner, um, a valuable asset, if you will, um, to many of the world's problems um, as we try and find solutions for them. So a lot of things going on, inshallah. So, yeah. so when, when you're coming up with the, with, with the script and with certain topics, mm -hmm. and we've seen this in your lecture series, Correct. where you are not afraid to address you know, so-called controversial to topics. Yes. In some circles, you know, certain topics are Taboo. considered Taboo. 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 Yes. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, as you've been addressing in the past few days. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to I mean, either this media or even in your lectures, uh, addressing these controversial topics, which are true to history, right? Uh, have you had any hesitancy in addressing those? And moreover, have you had any blowback which yes. has discouraged you or even encouraged you? So blowback is is very common whenever you are um, 
whenever you step into the public uh, opinion realm, right? Because it's about respecting that everybody has a right. And therefore, since I respect that everyone has a right, I respect the fact that nobody, not somebody, but nobody needs to agree with me, right? Um, again, growing up with performing arts and, and growing up with the British learning system, um, there's a lot of things that I'm sure, you know, I haven't been through the uh, American schooling system, but I'm sure certain elements of this will also resonate, is that sometimes you just have to listen to people. Because even if I don't agree with you, I'm still going to learn something. Even if I've learned nothing, and I think that everything you said is wrong, at the very least, I've learned that that's how you think. Which gives me an insight into your narrative and, and how your thought process may work. So from a blowback point of view, all day long, you know, as they say, until the cows come home, um, you can't please anybody. With regards to being hesitant, I think as a speaker, I would be failing in my duty if I didn't hesitate um, to address certain topics and if I didn't shy away from certain topics. Um, because whether I like it or whether I don't like it, and I really don't like it, the fact that somehow um, you are a standard for people um, to look up to, because that was never the intent. Um, my intent when I got involved in the speaking circuit um, was a very selfish intent. Um, it was about making amends with God and making amends with the prophet and his progeny um, for being so far away from my religion for the best part of 12 years, um, where I was heavily, heavily gang related, um, growing up in the East End of London. As I said, you know, you really wanted to kind of fit in. Um, so when I went to Karbala and I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and through the wasil of Imam Hussain alayhi salam Allah to reform me as an individual, I specifically asked that reform me through service to your cause. And at the time, uh, in all honesty, my, my greatest aspiration was to either like fix the shoes in the majlis or be able to serve the niyaz, you know, something on a very, very humble and unknown um, level because there are so many of these angels who serve in our majalis that we never know them by names, right? Um, and somehow, some way, within two weeks of coming back from Karbala, I, I get put on the stage and told that you have to recite a majlis um, without going too long into that story. And I was very, very hesitant and I was very reluctant and I argued with the people and I told them, I said, I am a very, very, very bad person. I know my past. I know that I've hurt people. And, and I remember saying uh, specifically to one of the brothers who was extremely adamant. Um, and here's the funny thing about it is that he was actually a Sunni brother um, who had come to attend the majlis. And I remember telling him so adamantly, I said, my character is more in line with someone who would have been in Yazid's army. And, and not someone who would have been with Imam Hussein alayhi salam Allah. And he smiled and he said, then you're like Hur because Hur was in Yazid's army. And when the opportunity presented himself to him, he didn't sit there saying, I'm not worthy. He just took it by hook or by crook. You know, he, he fought his way. So I fought my way through, um, again, those levels and la layers of identity that was uh, labeled onto me. Um, and I and I escaped from that into the loving arms of the Majlis of Abdullah Hussain alayhi salam. Um, so sometimes I found myself I would hesitate because I feel like it's not my place. That I'm I'm by no means a scholar. You know, I I, I read a lot of books again for selfish reasons. I, I became educated as a byproduct. Um, but there's a lot of times where I I know that I'm not the most learned person. Um, in a particular field. Um, so I hesitate, should I even discuss this topic? And sometimes you hesitate where you know talking about this topic is going to create some kind of uh, impact on the ground, like division, disunity on the ground. But the topic is such a hot topic that so many are talking about it and you feel, and I don't know if that's selfish from me to feel that my words are not being heard or my opinion on such a matter. But sometimes I listen to the people on the ground and you notice with, with me um, when I do my majalis, I'm, I'm not one of those people who sits in a room with pen and paper making notes. I actually sit down with the people and have 10 to 20 different conversations 
in the last hour before my majlis so that when I speak, it's relatable. You know, I, I understand what people are thinking, what questions do they have, and, and try and make it as wholesome as possible. But sometimes I feel like when I listen to the people on the ground and they feel that the minbar has let them down, in that the speakers on the podium are not addressing this issue, which is really, we know it's already disunity in the community, but we just need someone to come and maybe not add to the conversation, but just show a wiser course of action of how we can actually all disagree, but still look at the bigger picture that Islam above everything else, more important than my opinion, more important than your opinion. And in those conversations, those are the toughest ones because not only do I know that I'm not the most uh, qualified person to have that conversation, but at the same time, it's like you say it with the intention of doing good whilst also being aware of the bad that it can create and that, again, fitna and disunity. And you're kind of holding your heart in your hand and thinking, I hope this is not the thing that's going to put me in hell one day. You know, that my opinion as a person who was just sincere wasn't actually the right opinion and and it could have created problems in either a person's home or a person's community or our community in general so it's it's a lot of balance and stuff and um i know they say don't do too many istikharas but the quran and alhamdulillah this has been one of the blessings in my life is that the quran's kind of become my best friend you know um sure. when in doubt i just open it and start reading and i'll be like God, if it's a good page with good things, I'm going to rely on you. And, 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 and sometimes it's just so accurate because it just speaks to the exact topic that you're dealing with. So um, I say a lot of sincerity, a, lot of, a little bit of knowledge and heaps of love for the people that you serve um, will see you a long way in the Khidmah of Ahl Bayt Well, you don't, you don't call yourself a scholar, but uh, we, we, we definitely see you that way and definitely a wonderful orator. Inshallah, you see me as a as an older brother or a younger brother, you know, um, that we can just talk as a family and know that the person may not have the right answers, but we're just talking to family. We know it's coming from a good place. Um, that for me, I'll be content with, but scholar is, is definitely not me. So. All right, well, yeah. uh, to, to kind of ease up on things a little bit, I'm going to do a little exercise sure. here, if you don't mind. Some, throw some rapid fire words at you. Okay. And whatever comes to your mind, you know, what, what's your first thought on oh, these words? It's going to put me in hot water. I think you'll like this. <laughs> right. First one, uh -huh. Karbala. Pride. Tabarra. Wajib. Inspiration. Zainab. Mashallah. I like these. It's from the heart. Let's go. <laughs> Bucky. Oppression. Death. I would say oppression in that it's happening now. It, it hasn't stopped. It hasn't stopped. It's continued oppression, I think, would be the right word for Bucky. And what are your thoughts on the situation in general? The situation in general and in Bucky. Um, it's it's a lot of like right now there's a lot of things going on through my mind when you ask me that question because you notice I'm a person that talks a lot so when I'm quiet it really means there's a lot of processing happening inside there for me Baki is like someone close your family member okay and though you know the crime has taken place and though you know exactly who the criminal is and though you have all the forensic evidence you need to address the injustice that is happening you know you'll never get your justice and you see your killer or the killer of your loved one freely walking around unhindered without the slightest fear that this would ever come back to them in the dunya at the very least because see what al yahud and al saud are doing to jannat al baqir is that the whole reason why 
Al-Hijaz and Saudi Arabia, as they call it today, is what it is, is because of the people in Baqi. Mecca was Mecca for years and hundreds of years where pagans would come and they would, you know, do this pilgrimage and leave, right? But it was Islam of Muhammad وسلم, and the progeny of Muhammad and what they did that made this religion as vast as it was. Because before it was just Bedouins who would come to Mecca. Now Indians, Africans, Chinese, everywhere around the world, people come to Hajj and they go to Medina for Masjid al Nabawi. And the people who made this possible are denied a gravestone. The most basic right of, of any human being. I, I, you know, I drive past a cemetery in Chicago or in Minneapolis or in any other state um, within these United States or anywhere else in the world, and nobody is stopping anybody from putting a gravestone. But this legacy, this culture, this history, this identity of mine that I read about all the time is being oppressed, number one. Number two, the one who's oppressing them because of the petroleum that they have in that country and because of the unfortunate situation that in the West we have to rely on so much of that petroleum which makes them our ally, um, we know no one's going to bring them to the court of justice because we need them right now. It's, it's how the general leadership of the world is looking at the, the, the injustices that are happening. And again, like I said, it's like a family who is looking at the killer, looking at the murder weapon, looking at the you know piles and piles of evidence that in any other case would have put someone away uh, and given us our rights. But we continue to be oppressed every single day because we are not even given the opportunity to have that conversation in a court of law through a legal system. And when you are even attempting to kind of uh, have that conversation and bring light to it through a legal system, whether it's through the UN or whether it's through its, um, you know, heritage, site protections and so on and so forth, the pile of, you know, the mountain, I should say, of paperwork for bureaucracy and so on and so forth is thrown at you to dishearten, you know, to kind of make you feel that this is just not worth it anymore, you know. But alhamdulillah, the, 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 the flip side of that coin is that we're never going to get to a point where we feel it's not worth it, you know. Um, it just means we have to work harder and longer, and we will. It's, it's not an issue. So alhamdulillah, you know, uh, who, who would have even thought that in, in Chicago, you're going to have a studio called Baqi Studio, you know. Um, so, um, on that note, I just want to say one thing, which uh, is, is, again, one of those ideals that I've lived with me. Um, through those who are better than me. And specifically, I mean my father. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give our parents more and more of their due in the dunya and the akhirah uh, for raising us on Mawaddat Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad alayhi wa sallam. Because without them, believe me, um, in this free world, there's there's a million and one things that take you away from the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam. Very little that will push you towards them. But that little is great and, and that is good parents. Um, fortunate is the one who has them and even more fortunate is the one who is kind to them. My father told me a couple of things. One of them is that our deen as a Shia community is like a nail. The more you hit it, the more firm it becomes. You know, the nail they hammer it, they hammer it, but it just becomes more firm and not only does it become more firm, but it actually holds things together better. So let them hammer us with all the different, as Bibi Zainab says, you know, exhaust every avenue that is available to you, whether it's politic, whether it's media campaign, whether it's misinformation, whether it's bombs being dropped on us, whether it's blowing us up inside our majalis, whether it's attacking us and shooting us while we're in Jalus. Go out, go crazy, try and find new ways. It doesn't matter to us because our response is going to be the same response. We will die, but Hussein will live. You know? um, so these people who have kind of put their wager on us giving up, it's not going to happen. 
you know, Fashion. generation after generation, we will continue to press on and we'll continue. The only thing that saddens us, and again, I speak about myself here first and foremost, is that it's that fear of it may not happen in my lifetime, that I may not get to see the dome on top of Jannat al -Baqi. But without a doubt, we know there will be a dome on Jannat al -Baqi. So, because if it's not us, then it's Al-Hujjat ibn Hassan Abdullah al-Sharif. So we, we kind of know the end result. Um, we're just trying to figure out the, the correct mathematical equation of how to solve this problem. But we already know that, inshallah, it will be solved. So, inshallah. Yeah. Uh, that's it. I'd like to thank you for your time and yeah. for, for joining us here at Bucky Studios. Uh, inshallah, wish you the best on your endeavors inshallah. in forging that, that nail. Inshallah. Uh, make it strong for all of us and for our future generations. Inshallah. Inshallah. And, uh, definitely watch this space. Inshallah. We'll, we'll give you more information on um, the events that are coming. And Alhamdulillah, I'm not too far away from Chicago now. So we'll be seeing more of each other. Inshallah. Inshallah. We're looking forward to that. Likewise. Inshallah. Inshallah. Al-Baqir!